Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Did you type it on your phone? Call this meeting to order. We have the tremendous honor of, on the eve of 9-11, of having an honor guard to bring in the flags today. Gentlemen. At this point, if you just have a seat just for a minute, we have a couple of commissioners that would like to say something and then we're going to have our pledge. So uh, glad to have everyone here today. Um, this is bittersweet for me. Uh, I'm Bill Lashley, County Commissioner. I just want to thank the Board of Commissioners for giving me the opportunity to remember and honor my friends and colleagues that I lost that day in 9-11. I just want to take a few minutes. I had 32 friends on an exchange that day who lost their lives, and I would just like to sit down and let you hear their names. Dennis Fu, Stephen Furman, Doug Gardner, Joseph Heller, Joseph Holland, Robert Hassa, Joseph Kellett, Neil Levy, James McGallery Jr., great man, Thomas McGinnis, David Nelson, Edward Oliver, Alfred Ficosa, Edward Ryan, Joseph Shea, Paul Skrpeck, Superman, Carlton Volvo, Elkin Yen, Evan Barron, Michael Canty, Christopher Dinkoff, Brendan Dolan, Karen Klitzman, Damian Meehan, Peter Ramondi, Scott Times, Christopher Trania, Robert O'Shea, Patrick O'Shea, Mark Petroselli, Mark Matroni, and Lonnie Stone. All 32 of those folks are just like you and me. Just get up every day and go to work, try to support their families. You know, on that day, you know, the sense of security of this nation was shattered that day. But after these funerals that I attended, there, there's clarity in these folks' final acts. And there's clarity with those final phone calls. You know, I want to remember the ones that died that day. And I think about them every day. But I also want to remember who did this to me. It's important that we know who did this to me. And I just want to um, thank the commissioners for giving me the opportunity to do this. Um, I don't really know what else to say except, you know, there were some great folks that day some great folks and I'm very proud to know them very proud to work with them and I think about them every day I just thank you so much for giving me that
Mr. Turner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lashley, for those uh, for those comments and sentiments. Um, I'm just reminded of uh, of that day for me. I was in a Navy fighter squadron and was uh, writing the schedule for the next day flights. And when it became clear that this was a terrorist attack, we began to inquire about arming our aircraft, how we would get ordnance for aircraft that were essentially training aircraft at the time, and the heaviness of that request um, was was huge because we, we knew that you know, we weren't arming our aircraft to shoot down MiG-23s and MiG-25s. Um, and so we can never forget um, that attack and the, uh, the loss of life and, and attack not just on, on the towers, but uh, at the Pentagon I had friends on um, the Naval Intelligence Unit who were uh, involved in that, in that attack. And also the, the heroes on Flight 93 that probably saved the Capitol. Um, we can never ever forget the lessons. Um, and I think uh, um, it's appropriate that we just take a moment to consider that now. Thank you. Any other commissioners? I'd, I'd just like to uh, make a comment too. I, I didn't have any friends that I lost up there, but I had an associate who lost her sister, and uh, one of my board members that, that down in Florence, South Carolina, lost his brother. His brother was actually in the second tower to get hit, and when they checked to see whether they should evacuate, they were told not to, and uh, so he stayed at his job like most everybody else did until they were hit and do the same thing. But you know, the guys that brought these flags in represent the unbelievable heroes. It's one thing to get trapped in there, and I'm not trying to discount that by any stretch of the imagination, but the guys that went running up those tower steps trying to fight those fires, I can't even imagine the uh, intestinal fortitude it takes to do that. So thank them every day for what they do for us. I'm going to do something a little <coughs> unusual. You, <coughs> excuse me, you guys may fuss at me if I do this, but <laughs> I'll take that chance. Uh, would you each, all three of you, state your names and positions? Tony Massey, Thomas County uh, Inspector, Investigator, Fire Marshal's Office. General Martinez, Detention Officer. Janaira Martinez, Detention Officer. Thank you. Uh, Jesse Gwynn, Deputy Fire Marshal from Alamance County. And we want to say thank you to all of you folks and all of the... We don't ever need to forget 13 soldiers that we just lost. Yeah. And remember their families. And we haven't even met the soldiers that were injured so terribly. That's going to be another round. And um, as a military mom, I cannot imagine the military moms and what they're going through. And um, we just always have to have our stuff together when we lead. And we just cannot ever risk anybody's life for any other reason except to protect this country. Because they all walk in to serve just like law enforcement everybody else is. So um, we always need to keep these 13 they loved what they were doing, and they did it with such honor. Every soldier does. So that's all. And thank you. Okay, Mr. Lashley, you have the honors. A uh, convocation? Absolutely. Okay. Can we all bow our heads, please? Dear Lord, thank you for this day that you have created. Give us the wisdom and the guidance to take care of the business for the citizens of Alamance County. And dear Lord, we know all things are possible through you. In your name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Okay, do we have any public speakers? Okay, no public speakers. I assume then no commissioners' comments. Okay, approval of the agenda. Motion to approve. I understand we have one member that would like to make a motion prior to the motion to approve. Is that correct? Uh, for the consent agenda. Consent agenda. Do I make that motion right this second? Well, I'm sorry. Okay. The agenda itself, you have a motion, I'll second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, now to the consent agenda. Yes, Chairman, I would like to um, make a motion that we pull the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council nominee, Dr. Luana Northfleet. I'll second that, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Any comments? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. For the audience, uh, what that means is everything on the consent agenda was just approved. Uh, excuse me, everything on the consent agenda has not yet been approved. We're going to vote on it minus that one item. Uh, and Ms. Thompson, which item is that on the list? That is the um, number three, the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council, Dr. Lamont Northley. All right. Okay, with the exception of that one item, uh, do we have a motion as to the approval of the consent agenda? I'll make that motion. Second. Have a motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <coughs> Unanimous. Thank you. And Madam Clerk, um, we'll just add that on as item number, I suppose, uh, four. So it'll be 8.4. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, do you want to make that 9.1 under? Oh, let's, let's do that. That'll be okay. fine. So that okay, uh, we have the request for the excise tax refund. Good morning, commissioners. We have a request for a, a refund of overpaying. Tax stamps, I believe somebody's on Zoom. Christy Wood, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Miss um, Wood wrote a letter uh, to me and provided evidence that there was an overpayment of excise tax uh, through mutual mistake, and she has requested a refund in the amount of $1,170 from the Alamance County uh, Board of Commissioners. We had the same problem come up couple of meetings back mm -hmm. and we have to come before the board to get refunds in this nature. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Turner, I, uh, sometimes you're on the screen, sometimes you're not. Just speak up if, if I'm not recognizing you. Peter, my screen, I thought oh, this wood might be on the, uh, they might put this wood on. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, any further discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. Next will be uh, the evidentiary hearing. Mr. Turner, I think that's you. Uh, and Ms. Kyle, that's. Mr. Chairman, do you want to swear the witnesses in before uh, this call begins, sir? That would be, be excellent. And Madam Clerk, I understand you're doing the swearing in. Yes. You need the applicant as well. And any witnesses you have that are going to testify. If you just come forward, mm -hmm. put your left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand. Are any of the others witnesses? No. All right. Okay. okay. Face the clerk, please. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give to the commission shall be the truth, 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Okay. Would you state your name for the record? Uh, Anthony Ronald Mullins. And Tanya Cattle. Thank you. And give your address, please, sir. Uh, 3103 Isley Drive, Snow Camp, North Carolina. And what is your position as to this matter? Uh, I'm the owner of the of this project. Ms. Gallo, your, your position? Planning and Inspections Director for Elements County. All right, thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. This morning we have an evidentiary hearing on uh, manufactured home park requests from several times of a home park phase two. That is pin number 101785. This parcel is on Friendship Rock Creek Road in Snow Camp. Uh, like I said, it's a manufactured home park review by ordinance. The parcel is 22.75 acres. Uh, the applicant is requesting consideration for review of lot standards for lot size with a minimum of 30,000 square foot road frontage, requirements of 100 foot along a road, two designated parking spaces outside of Clearway for each space, with min minimum size 20 by 20 with four inch thick gravel surface, minimum setback of 45 feet from center line of clearway or 25 feet from edge of the clearway, rear setback of 10 foot, all garbage and refuge must be placed, placed rather in a watertight, fly tight, standard garbage receptacle and kept covered with tight fitting covers. Manufactured home parts must have a clearway of 50 foot. This review would would be um, on the site plan that's been submitted uh, for your review. The review is for the space range of 100 foot with minimum setback requirements also are being reviewed. Uh, this application has just a few things more. We have been through a uh, technical review for this project and in that review we had just a few comments uh, I'd like to share with you all. Uh, from NCDOT, DOT is requesting an additional uh, driveway permit if this project is approved. Uh, we had just a few planning comments which I just listed about the minimum requirements that we were, were not able to meet with the drawing. And um, our fire marshal's office had no comments. They were okay with the roads just as they were. Uh, that was the conclusion of all of our technical review for this project. Uh, for purposes that you all are looking at, uh, road, the space and road frontage, the parking setbacks, uh, there was no concern with signage or addressing, and the site plan was attached. What we have on this project for the spirit of the ordinance, the property has natural constraints, including contour constraints for development and a septic system, opportunities that create practical difficulties and particular hardships in carrying out the strict letter of the ordinance. The intent of the ordinance is to protect the integrity of the community with adequate lot size, setback requirements, and establishing road standards. This development meets the intent of manufactured home park ordinance. Uh, par, as far as the public health, the design of manufactured home park as required by ordinance protects public welfare, safety, and general welfare through the design guidelines provided in the ordinance. This project has been reviewed by the County Environmental Health Department to declare the park meets the, their state requirements. County Planning Department has reviewed for configuration road requirements and other design requirements in the park. County Fire Marshal's office has found the proposal to meet the requirements to get emergency services to the development and adequate to serve the park. The design configuration lots are addressed in the, man in the manufactured home ordinance. Uh, if anybody has any questions for me, I also have a paper site plan if that works better. I know y'all have the electronic version. I'll just think that. Mr. Chairman, may I suggest that all the evidence she's just presented be entered into the record? And we thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a quick question for us, All right, we'll accept that all into evidence. It is now part of the record. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, sir. Ms. Cattle, what did you say were the, were the restraints? There was the contour, and what was the other? Let me pull that back out. The contours of the land is the main environmental constraint for this project. It has natural constraints, including contour constraints for development and septic system opportunities that create practical difficulties and particular hardships in carrying out the strict letter of the ordinance. 
Excuse me, just one second. Did I answer your question, Mr. Turner? Uh, I'd like to uh, ask a follow up once the chair is ready. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead, please, sir. Um, what, are the, what are the contour issues? So when you pull the contours on the property, there's just a couple flat areas on the property and then the property rolls further back in side to side with steep drops in the land. So for practical purposes, cutting in infrastructure and putting septic fields in creates a hardship different than a flat piece of land would. Okay, thank you. As I understand it, we have a, let's, it's not just the commissioners, we have an entire audience out there. Uh, we have a mobile home ordinance, correct? A manufactured home park ordinance is what this falls under. All right. And this really is not conducive to uh, that application, is it? Right. So a little history for the county. I think a lot of people know this, but everyone doesn't. And along about 2015, the county had an RV park and a manufactured home park ordinance that actually sat in environmental health for enforcement. That ordinance was rewritten and handed to planning to enforce. And by definition in our manufactured home park ordinance, the definition manufactured home includes RVs, campers, things such as that, and tiny homes. So that's how I believe they pulled those together to put them into one ordinance. So minimum lot sizes and things look more like a traditional manufactured home park, less like what he is asking for, more of an RV park. So when planning board did review this application, they did suggest that we reevaluate that and possibly write something that would separate RV parts and manufactured home parts again. So the planning board is currently working on uh, amending that ordinance or adding a new ordinance? So Thursday night they will meet to begin that process. This coming Thursday night? Yes, sir. All right, and that is a public meeting, is it not? It is. Uh -huh. We do it by Zoom and onto YouTube so public can be a part in person as well. What time is that? Seven o'clock on Thursday night. And state the location, please. It is at 201 West Elm Street, uh, directly across the street from this building. Right. So literally, if you went out the front door of this building, across the street, you're there. You're there, yes. Right. You see oh, what used to be called the Ag Building. Mm -hmm. All right. But we're not approving this no. No, before no, 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 they no. have an ordinance, right? No, no, I know. Okay. Uh, we, we will approve this, possibly this approve this variance. Okay. Uh, today or at a later meeting, okay. but this is not about the ordinance at all. Okay. I just want right. that this will fall under <coughs> ordinance just because of the timing of when he put it in. Okay. Mr. Lashley, I think you have questions. Yes, I have a few questions. Um, first, uh, Tanya, I just, Miss Cagle, excuse me, I just want you to, uh, if I say anything that's not proper, I want you to correct me. Okay? I have yes, several sir. questions. Uh, my first and my first question that I have, and I think it supersedes all other questions I have. Um, after looking at this mobile home, manufactured mobile home park, um, I'm trying to figure out why why he's even here asking us. Because there is no campground ordinance, and that's basically what he's trying to do. He wants to start a campground. M my question is. Uh, I, I'm more concerned about the planning board that has tried to fit this, this particular location into this ordinance because what good is the ordinance if you change it? You know what I'm saying? I'm just, what I'm trying to say is I don't think that he need, even need to come here and ask us to, to start a mobile home park. Now, with that being said, uh, that asked that several other questions arise when I was thinking about his particular situation. Yes, sir. And I guess my question is, is the new construction that he's gonna do on his property, is that gonna be, is that gonna be um, in, line, in line with current ordinances that we have? Is well, that's part of what he's asking for forgiveness this morning for, is part of that project is not gonna be in line with the ordinance, so it's up to commissioners to say his hardship is enough to meet those requirements and be okay with that. Uh, your first question speaks to the manufacturing home ordinance and by definition it speaks to uh, travel trailers, campers, or motor homes or any other transportable structure with or without a permanent foundation being used as a residence within an approved manufactured home park shall be considered a manufactured home. So by definition his RV park, his RVs fall under that definition of manufactured home in this ordinance. Are there people currently living there on that property? There is a phase one that there are some you already have units in that. I guess the one question that would answer your questions do they have long term leases available? 
Oh, that sorry. would be a question for the applicant. That's not, I don't have knowledge of that. And let me kind of uh, clarify, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong as well. Uh, phase one was pr approved by a previous board. Correct. So they're in compliance. Uh, phase two now would not meet compliance under the uh, conditions that have changed since the ordinance of 2015. So consequently, he's here asking for a variance for phase two <coughs> so that it will be in compliance with our current ordinance. I wanted just to clarify some things you said. Um, I sit on the health department board on the health. And um, is there a community septic tank system? system? Yes. And um, has a permit been issued? Uh, they have permit? already done a review in it, but an actual permit. Have you pulled all, all your permits? The, all the stuff all is tooled, permits. but they haven't completed the, I haven't paid for it until I knew I had approval mm -hmm. to go with it for them to do the AC. So the answer is no. He's got a, you've got a proven permit? Yeah. So he's got the improvement permit, but not the authorization to construct it. Uh, one other thing I wanted, and you did mention it, and I'm glad you did, because I think it's uh, after making a few phone calls to the people who lives in that neighborhood, um, one thing I think is extremely important is traffic considerations. That particular area, and the reason I know anything about it is I do some hunting out there, and uh, th that particular area is, there, there's been fatalities out there. There has been accidents out there. So it's going to be extremely important that uh, these, these additional, there's going to be additional traffic just based on increased people coming out. Mm -hmm. So I definitely would like to uh, see a little bit more from the DOT. Uh, after I wrote out there yesterday mm -hmm. and just so, some things that I noticed that, uh, you know, those cars run up that highway 55, 70 miles an hour uh, and have they exiting and entering off of 49 and to me I sat out there yesterday for a half hour saw trucks tractor trailers loggers all in about a 35 minute span so that just made this made a, uh, a red flag for me that we certainly need to keep an eye on the traffic out there and make sure that um, that that is taken care of before the, the, the park is even open so right, NCDOT did evaluate this project when we went through technical review. Did uh, anyone from the planning board mention the traffic? I don't remember any discussion about traffic for this that's, project. Ms. Kittle, that's very concerning mm -hmm. for the planning board. Not one person on that board who lives out there saw that there was a problem with the traffic out there. That's concerning. And the reason I'm even bringing it up, Ms. Cadle, is like, I want to tell my other fellow county commissioners as well. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, going forward here, we're getting ready to embark on something that's, to be honest with you, scares the hell out of me with this zoning. It need, it cannot be done wrong. It has to be done perfect. We have to hit our target. And I truly want the planning board to hear me when I say this. It is imperative that we get clear, concise, and everybody's on the same page. I, I, don't, I don't like the ambiguity of this RV park just because after doing some due diligence, I don't even think he needs to ask us to start campground out there. But the planning board has decided that they want to fit this into some manufactured home part that doesn't exist. And that's my concern. If the planning board will go down this road to try to do this, like I said, I'm scared that, that that's gonna happen to me when it comes time to zoning and we're getting ready to jump in this, and this we're, is yeah be we're in it we're going to be doing public meetings in the next probably 30 to 60 days for the zone. just want to let you know my concerns it's my questions and i do appreciate you answering them thank sure. you so much and the planning board did get that synopsis of the ncdot had looked at it so maybe that cleared their mind i'm not sure good thank you i appreciate it i just have a simple question who who lives here are these like folks that have temporary jobs that come in and out, that kind of thing, or is this like mm -hmm. tourists coming here to see? The, I mean, who is your clientele? You want to step forward and join? I mean, I'm, I'm looking I'm at you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm uh, a rookie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just asking, like, who who well, wants to live here? Y'all have to forgive me because I'm not used to being in front of a crowd. And talking. <laughs> we're not <laughs> even. <laughs> we'll just pretend we're at a coffee shop. Oh. Yeah. The majority of what is out there right now is out of state, out of town, traveling nurses, 
Okay. That they'll be here anywhere from six months, three months, four months. That's the majority of what's there. But we do have some that we're keeping for nightly people that just come in on the weekends, be here for a week. Um, we do have we have had a couple that have moved in out there and been there for a few months while they were building their house come in from other places. But the majority of it is out of town workers that are here working on big projects. Do you have security? We have security cameras. Okay, uh, but you don't have the dude in a golf cart riding around making sure things are okay. <laughs> well, my, my daughter and son-in-law live out there. They, okay. they stay there, so they're there all the time. <clears throat> And I have some of Alamance County's finest that have, have come through. You live through. out there. And, and, <laughs> I live, I live, but I have a few of the deputy sheriffs that have, they, they cruise through there when they're doing their rounds. They'll okay. just cruise through. Okay, so there's no pool. There's no, no okay. Okay. Are people bringing their own RVs when they come in, or do you have RVs that you're renting, or both? Just, just theirs. These are, I, I these are their RVs. Yeah, okay. It's all theirs. Um, as far as the ultimate ordinance is concerned, one of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things I've seen that would concern me, and I think we need to be careful of, is zero lot lines, allowing construction or placement up to a lot line. I've seen that happen. I saw the saw the results of a fire down at Ocean Lakes, down in Myrtle Beach. Uh, my, daughter's mother-in-law had, had a place down there and hers didn't burn my goodness but well when the fire started it just jumped from one unit to the next real fast almost like an apartment building um, we need to make sure we don't allow that and uh, um, but I, I think the concept is a good concept we just make sure we get the I mean, we have people who like to travel through here and <clears throat> visit our parks and this is right near if I understand it correctly, it's near uh, Rock Creek. Yeah, yeah. Yes, um, it's become a real popular park for the county. So, and the southern part of the county, going down there, Saxbahaw, and getting down there and touring that area, hiking. Um, it's a great location, and I, I think it's a good idea. I think it, it, it probably will be very successful. But uh, I think in, in the documents we read, I think you said you have about a 90 or 95 percent occupancy rate right now. I want to say 100 because we we got two spots that are empty right now, but by next week they'll be full and we'll be back full again. And it's it's been like that for the last year. So. Well, I wish you a lot of success, and I hope we can get this ordinance right so that we can make it work for you. And can I answer or make a statement towards your Certainly, question? Sure. Uh, Absolutely, your, uh, Absolutely. About the traffic mm -hmm. situation, and I think Terry will go along with me. Before I bought the piece of property and started it, there was a lot more accidents there. Um, we, we have cleared it a whole lot from what it was, so you can see both in sides. both directions a whole lot better. Now, that, that's not stopped all the accidents. They've they've still been there. It's just a bad People run up that highway bad pretty place, quick. But, pretty quick. but we have gotten a lot clearer, and the DOT guy, he came out, and I had all the stuff cut down so you could see far enough for him, so. Okay. Um, but. Great. Thank you for addressing that. I appreciate that. What Mr. Carter is talking about uh, also would include, I think, at Myrtle Beach, um, like park units that are there on a permanent basis. So you're not talking about that at all, are you? When I first originally started this thing in 2017, 2016, 17, I had three phases that I wanted to do of it. When one, I was felt good about it, then we move on. Our third phase, we are contemplating maybe trying to come up with some type of smaller cabin type things just on, in the third phase. Like a tiny uh, home? Well, <laughs> somewhat like, but it's called a primitive cabin, I think. Um, I, I've seen some, some primitive cabins, and they're, they're, they are they're don't have cooking facilities in them. They're just a, an overnight stay, okay. and that's what we're kind of leaning towards unless the second phase fills up with campers like that then we may go campers again <laughs> but we're not dealing with phase three at this point no. anyway uh, Ms. Cattle I assume uh, Director Cattle uh, 
we want to make sure the planning board uh, takes all that into consideration, including potentially phase three uh, for some type of more permanent unit. Uh, but I'm sure you guys are already working on that. We have not seen a site plan yet, and planning board did not hear about the third phase. They only heard about phase two. So I would ask the planning department to keep that in mind right. when we come up with the ordinance in the future. Mm -hmm. But we're not dealing with that today. Good luck to you. Yes, thank you. I'll see you on Undercover Balls. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be next, anyway. In order to approve this, um, we've got to find that the applicant complies with the provisions of the ordinance. Um, and or the variance and so forth, that practical difficulties and or unnecessary hardships will result if we do not approve of this. Uh, Ms. Cattle, can you state specifically what these, does this project meet these conditions? This project has the constraints of where septic can go and the contours of where the whole improvements for the project can go. Those seem to be the environmental constraints on the land for the project itself. And what practical difficulties uh, or hardships exist in this one that should allow us to approve this variance? That falls back to the land itself as well, the practical difficulty of making anything buildable out there uh, for any purpose, whether it be residential, commercial, or for his purpose. Problem, I guess, is parking. Well, because of how the land rolls, the perking right. and getting the roads in to where you're at a place where you're flat enough to get any kind of structure in there. And in order to approve this uh, variance, we have to find uh, that the modification is, is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the ordinance. Does it meet that criteria? So the general intent and health, safety, welfare for the public is met by making sure that fire marshal and septic systems and everything can be achieved. So those were accomplished with the intent. All right, and it is in, uh, basically in the spirit and insurance of the public safety, welfare, and substantial justice to approve this, is that correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Turner, do you, uh, do you have any questions? My questions have been answered, thank you. Board, any other questions? Just about Perkin, because of some other situations with not Perkin. What a word. Mm -hmm. This is, this land will perk? He's already been through that. That's part of our review process, okay. is they have to go through that first step. Okay. All right. Um, at this point, I think we need a motion to close the uh, hearing portion. Is that correct, Mr. Albright? That is correct. You can, you can make the motion now to close the evidentiary hearing, or you can wait until you've had your discussion where you discuss the facts. And I, I would point out that the only facts you should consider are the ones presented by the applicant and Ms. Uh, Alley. Right. And in your opinion, has he met that burden? I, I'm not a finder of fact. You, you members of the board are. And I think you just went down the list that talked about uh, the, the things that need to be shown. <clears throat> Ms. Cattle has uh, shown them. And if you look back at the the requirements of the ordinance. He's asking for a reduction in the size of the lot. He's asking for uh, parking spaces and other limitations. It's not a mobile home he's putting out there. It's a recreational vehicle. So it really doesn't fit the greater size. <clears throat> he's asking you to vary the ordinance to allow a smaller recreational vehicle to occupy the space. So if you, if you find that all those facts have been presented, <clears throat> then we appreciate your clarity. Board, any other questions? Mr. Turner? If there are no other questions, uh, do we have a motion to close the evidentiary portion of this hearing? Motion to close. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I made a motion to approve the uh, variance is in order at this time, then the board may discuss. Thank you. Do we have a motion 
for the variance. Motion to approve. Do we have a second? I'll make the second. Any further discussion? Any concerns? Mr. Lashley, you have a concern. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I just, I'm just, I, I just think that uh, you know, I applaud the man uh, starting a business, always behind business. I just don't, I just don't think he needed to even come in front of us. I mean, there, it was a campground ordinance, but I know that the planning board wants to. Uh, I'm more concerned about the planning board may have, whether they realize it or not, started a manufacturer home park. That's my that's my take on it. I think the planning board has actually stepped in front of themselves, to be honest with you, and that's concerning. But that's my only concern going forward, because I know going forward we're going to be we're going to be in the weeds if things like this happen to our planning board. That's my only concern, and I'm just putting a red flag out. Any other comments, uh, Mr. Chairman? My my primary concern was uh, was answered by your question, and that was whether. There are permanent sites here in phase two, which would be a whole lot like, more like a, a mobile home park, um, which, which may, you know, which would bring in, I think, a, a more discerning look in whether we need to have lot sizes that are as big as um, as other mobile home parks. But that's not the case here. That was my primary concern, and so that's going to lead me. John, I, I just have had the neighbors. Are there neighbors, or are you way out in the country as far as, have your neighbors voiced any kind of concern? Because we've got a rock quarry where neighbors have really voiced a lot of concerns. And I'm just curious, have you had any kind of feedback to that? The whole block, mm -hmm. the whole block that I'm on is my property okay. and one other fellow. Okay. And I'm in, I'm in talks with him all the time. Uh, nothing there I've, I've heard nothing from anybody you know but it's it's pretty much 36 acres and i've left buffer it's a wooded buffer all the way around the whole thing so it's all enclosed so you have a buffer not just a bush right i appreciate that <laughs> maybe you should give a tutorial on buffers because <laughs> i think we could all use that I, I appreciate your openness i really do we don't find this out later after it's done happen. So and that's, thank you. That's truly all it is, sir. It's just making sure we dot our I's and cross our T's. After what happened with the snow camp line, that's not gonna happen on my watch. Yeah. I'm gonna redouble my efforts to make sure that does not happen again. Uh, one issue I see is uh, DOT is apparent. Where is Ms. Caldwell? Shoot. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, he went and hid from me. <laughs> I was trying anyway, right? <laughs> Um, yes, sir. Has DOT indicated any interest in making some adjustments signage-wise, uh, warning lights, or anything else? If there's an issue there, I did get one call, and I think uh, several of us probably got the same call concerning pulling. Uh, he, in, in this particular case, he happened to have almost gotten in an accident pulling a uh, um, cattle trailer <coughs> out. Obviously, when you're pulling something heavy like an RV or cattle trailer or whatever, you can't move real fast when you pull out into the roadway. Um, I guess if there's any cattle in there, you definitely don't want them to get injured, so you're not going to be jerking them around. And I almost got into an accident with somebody coming around a blind curve. So my concern is, are we getting DOT to take a look at that part of the issue to make sure that if there, uh, from what I understand, there may be a blind curve. I haven't been out there, but you were, Bill. Yeah. Um, a blind curve coming into it, and I think you said you've cleared some of it, but um, we don't want anybody getting hurt uh, because somebody's pulling, definitely don't want one of your tenants getting injured or their vehicle getting destroyed, somebody pulling out. If, if we need to have warning lights, warning signage, or something like that. Should that not be communicated to DOT? So have you applied to DOT for the driveway permit? I have my permit. Yeah. Okay, so I they evaluated that during the permit, and I guess we can ask, once he actually gets going and they see the true traffic count and what's going on out there, we can ask and see if they're willing to do anything. Of course, we don't have any control over that, but we can bring it to their attention when he gets phase two open. I would highly encourage I would too. Uh, 
Sheriff's Department, uh, we as commissioners, you as planning a director, and so forth, you as the owner, uh, to contact DOT and highly encourage more signage, uh, lights, whatever's necessary. I used to own a travel trailer, did for years and years. Uh, and they are not fast. <laughs> they, pulling out in the traffic, they are slower, uh, but they're wonderful units. The good thing is, once you park it and set it up, you're not moving out every time you go to the grocery store or go to the park or go to the whatever. Right. It's sitting there for a period of time. So it's not like it's a constant traffic issue uh, any more than pulling your truck out or your car out uh, on a normal occasion. So uh, I'm less concerned on a day-to-day -day basis, but a major concern on a longevity basis. And I would encourage all of us in the Sheriff's Department, so contact DOT now, don't wait for the opening of phase two. Because um, NASA can hurt, it can, can happen at any time, and it's not gonna wait on us. So we'll wait until what happens. That's right. A lot of times they wanna see an actual traffic count before they start an investigator or start looking at it, but we can contact them and let them know that we'd like and have an interest in looking at that. You know, additionally, I understand even uh, the public warehouses, uh, I understand you have residents that are construction folks that are uh, staying at your park uh, that are members of that uh, construction group and uh, the organization of that. So, and by the way, uh, that's Publix Warehouse, just barely over in Gilbert County, uh, is projected to have over a thousand employees. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, part of them will be Malmes County and spending money at the new Publix at Holly Hill Mall. So, <laughs> I don't think it's called Holly Hill anymore, but it whatever is. it's called. It is. I went back to it. And just for yeah. for, for y'all's information, you were talking about phone calls that you got. We did advertise in the newspaper for two weeks prior to the project, and then we did send mailers out to adjacent property owners, and the property was posted by county staff to let everybody know that there was a hearing today. And for the audience, again, we as commissioners know that requirement and the notice and publication is required. So we're very comfortable with that. Any other comments or questions? Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. You, I'll I'll you a motion to take a second. No. All right. Okay, any other discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We look forward to your success. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mr. Allroy, uh, I know there's paperwork that has to be put together, and I will. Uh, lean heavily upon you for, for, for well, that Mr. documentation. Chairman, uh, the quasi judicial hearing and, and what is required next is the preparation of a document to be signed by you as the chair indicating the decision has been uh, approved, the variance has been approved. And then once that uh, document is reviewed by you, signed by you, and entered into the records of the minutes, then it becomes a, uh, a final decision. Excellent. And I appreciate it and look forward to your help. Has to be recorded by the board clerk, I believe. That's correct. I have just a minute. I think uh, my agenda's been modified. Uh, we will now bring the matter that was on the consent agenda of moved uh, with the uh, current, <coughs> the Jack committee. JCPC. JCPC. Thank you. No problem. There's so many abbreviations. <laughs> All right. Would you continue, please, ma'am? Um, I asked for this to be pulled off of um, the consent agenda. Um, because I would like to submit, however I need to say this, to um, Alamance Burlington School System that they can reconsider and possibly submit another name. For their appointment. And 
do you have a recommendation for a replacement or do you wish to just carry that over? Well, I do, but she wouldn't know it. And I don't want to like spring something like that on her. <laughs> but that's not my decision, that's theirs. So your motion is to uh, place this on the table, take it off the agenda entirely today, mm -hmm. and then move it to the September, uh, what's our next meeting date? It's 17th? It's 16th. So you want to have this move to this uh, to the agenda for the 16th? This is yeah. Thank you. We have a we have a moving date, by the way. <laughs> Not intentional. Okay. Okay. Is that your motion? That is my motion, Chairman Paisley. I'll second. Your motion second. Uh, any comments, Mr. Turner? I don't have any comments. Okay. <laughs> Okay, all in favor of moving this to the September 20 meeting, uh, say aye. 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 And unanimous again. Thank you. Madam Clerk, if you would just move that to the next meeting. All right, Mr. Baker. Just for the audience again, we have two, two Brian's, by the way. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Mr. Uh, Brian Baker is a Wake Forest Law School grad. That's right. So I thought we ought to announce that. And Wake Forest is now, after the first football game, is what's... Or un undefeated, first in the league. <laughs> 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 okay. Getting used to being on, on top of the stand. <laughs> Getting used to being on top. <laughs> That's right. It's a new and again, just for clarification, uh, in that school kind of east of us on a hill, what, what's their record? <laughs> There's several other losers from this past okay. weekend, so they'll probably get used to that as well. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, when you're a Wake Forest fan, you gloat when you can. That's an early lesson. Um, it doesn't last. Strike that from the record, Mr. <laughs> uh, I'm before you today to get some uh, additional members appointed to the Recreation and Parks Commission. We actually have four vacancies on the Recreation and Parks Commission. Um, and we have been fortunate over the past uh, several months to receive 17 applications for those four positions. So we've had a lot of people to consider. Uh, the Recreation and Parks Commission has reviewed all those applicants and made some recommendations. Um, those recommendations include Mike Dunning, Lisa Wolf, Peter Dahl, and Kelly Ronow. Uh, Lisa Wolf and Peter Dahl are both here today in the back row. Um, many of you probably know Lisa. She was with the city for many, many years. And if you don't know Peter, you should. He's uh, one of our best volunteers and has been uh, out building trail for us every week or so this year um, has been a great asset to our department. So uh, those are our recommendations, and if you have any questions about those members, I'm happy to take those as well. Weren't you at the river when the snake come out to attack us? <laughs> <laughs> to I know it was a whole I think plan. he meant to greet us, but yes, he was there okay. to greet Okay, anaconda. Us. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> the river welcoming committee was there. Oh. <laughs> I'll second. Okay, I have a couple of comments. One, I served on the uh, Recreation and Parks Board for years, uh, and I, I know, I think both you guys, and Ms. Renau uh, served on the board that I served on for many, many years, uh, and I, I know those three individuals personally um, and know their qualifications. So. Uh, this group's really committed to parks and rec. It's amazing. They're just not on the list. They are really committed. Mr. Chairman, just a quick note. I served closely with Ms. Wolf uh, when I was on Burlington Parks and Rec Committee, and I was impressed by both her knowledge uh, and her passion for the topic, so I fully support uh, her nomination. I would also like to say I went through each and every one of the applicants. Uh, I was extremely impressed with the qualifications of, of each and every applicant. And those that were that will not be chosen, I would highly encourage you to apply again, if not for this position, but other positions. Uh, I was just extremely pleased with the applicants. Uh, and these four are the cream of the crop. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say the same thing we're getting some really high quality 
volunteers in our county. It's a wonderful thing to have people want to step up and serve. And by saying cream of the crop, I don't mean the others aren't qualified, they certainly are. <laughs> Any other comments? Not that I can say. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Strike that from the record. <laughs> okay. Uh, all in favor signify by saying of these four applicants, um, and repeat the names again Kelly Ronow, Mike Dunning. Lisa Wolf and Peter Dahl. All right. In favor of those four applicants, signify by saying aye. 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 Mr. Turner? Put it aye. Excellent. So it's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Uh, who's. Uh -huh. You're here. <laughs> State your name, please. Good morning. I'm Jana Elliott. I'm Assistant Director of Operations with the Health Department. Tony asked me to present on his behalf today. Um, so first, I'd like to start you know, by thanking our staff, the Health Department staff and volunteers who are continuing to work tirelessly uh, in our huge COVID effort. Um, we are vaccinating, we are testing, case investigating, contact tracing, um, and uh, folks are working uh, tremendously hard and so our deepest appreciation to health department staff. Um, Tony prepared these slides on Friday so the data in these slides was pulled on Friday. Um, this first slide shows you that our case counts are continuing to go up. Um, as of Friday we had 987 active cases. I believe that's over 1200 active cases today. Um, we've had 10 additional deaths since Tony last presented at the Board of Commissioners on August 17th, and one more um, has been reported um, since this data was pulled. So that's 11. Um, this slide here um, shows you that our case rate um, per 1,000 um, over the last seven days, it is 443.63. Um, that makes us a high community transmission county, as is all of the state of North Carolina. And our positivity rate is there 12.83% uh, um, for testing. Uh, this information here is provided to you from um, Cone Health. Um, this is illustrating that um, as of this reporting, which I believe was midnight on Thursday night slash Friday morning, um, 89% of all Cone Health Hospital ICU beds were uh, at capacity, 89% capacity. And then um, the diagram below shows um, the light blue are vaccinated patients and the dark blue are unvaccinated patients. And so you can see that um, unvaccinated patients make up the majority of COVID related hospitalizations. Can you actually give us a number because uh so down below it says that um, completely hospitalized COVID patients, there's 135, 123 of those are unvaccinated and 12 are fully vaccinated. In the ICU, there's 38 COVID patients, 35 are unvaccinated, three are fully vaccinated. And then on um, event to help with breathing, there are 25 COVID patients, 23 are unvaccinated and two are fully vaccinated. And how does this variant compare with the previous back uh, almost a year ago? Um, so I don't know that, but I can get that information for you. <laughs> yeah, Commissioner Faisley, it's uh, most of this thing's broken down. It's like 90, 10. It's 90 unvaccinated, 10 vaccinated, 10%. It's usually how it falls yeah. across all the data that I've seen going all across the state. Yeah. It's some places 88, 12, some mm -hmm. ours is 90, 10. Right. Um, we didn't have vaccines this time last year, so everybody hospitalized last year was um, unvaccinated. Um, and what I can tell you is that this next slide will show you. What I really meant, I'm talking about severity. Severity. Not, uh, vaccination versus non-vaccination. The ICU listings probably. Right, we'll have to get that data from last year. Right. Thank Let you. me ask you this before I forget it. When you talk about cone, you're not talking about ARNC. It's all of cone health. But I mean, so we have COVID patients here at ARMC. Yes, we do. Whereas before, I know we didn't. Right. right. They were um, all going to old women's or what they were calling Green Valley. 
and now that hospital is being used um, in other ways, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so um, there are COVID patients in all the hospitals. So when you say those numbers, you're not talking about ARMC itself. It's Big Cone Health. Okay, that's that's so important. Any hospital that yeah. is um, owned by Cone Health. Because there, that number is spread out amongst all different hospitals. They're not all with ARMC. That doesn't take one thing away from this at all. I'm just saying when we see that, sometimes we think, oh my God, at ARMC we got 130 some people. Right. That cope, but we don't. Yeah. And thank goodness we don't. But at the same time, when they were all being funneled into a smaller number, that was a different story. But th that's just important to know that we don't have 130 some over in Burlington on Huffman Mill Road. How many locations does Cone Health currently have? I don't know the answer. It's a large number. It is. Yeah. Aren't they at AnyPen? Aren't they? AnyPen, um, ARMC, Moses Cone in Greensboro. Um, I know those three. I'm not sure. And they have other units, right? Well, probably, yeah. Just, just making sure we understand that because it looks like our hospital, nobody can go to ICU because there's so many COVID patients there, and that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. Anybody in ICU is ultra serious, so sure. Are they once again deferring? Um, I don't believe that they. I don't believe that they've stopped doing uh, non-elective or elective surgeries. Um, I don't believe that they have stopped doing that yet, but I think it's something that they're considering. And that would be all hospital systems are looking at that. I had a conversation yesterday with somebody, and I know, I know this is not under the purview of the uh, health department, but it might be an issue that you could bring up with Cone. Uh, an individual was admitted with COVID, was for some reason, I don't, I don't know the details, the person that called me about it didn't know the details, but for some reason they were told they did not qualify for being administered the hydroxychlor hydroxychloroquine drug. They weren't qualified for it, so they didn't get it, and then they died. Or one of the deaths we've experienced, apparently. Um, I don't know what you have to do to qualify for it, but I don't, from my understanding, that drug's not limited in availability. I don't know why they would tell somebody they couldn't get it, but I'd like to find out why that might have happened. I mean, if you want to get it, you ought to be able to get it, I would think. Well, many have voiced opinions about the therapeutics that are very helpful in COVID, and that certainly cannot be po political at all. Right. Anything can. So. Can you verify that that occurred? Beg your pardon? Yeah. No, I, I got the call yesterday afternoon. No, I can't verify. So it's not it. a verify. I haven't got a verify. chance to verify it, but I was, that's, what he, that's what he was told by the family that he had asked for it. was told that he, apparently the circumstances of the time didn't qualify him for it and he wasn't allowed to get it. So is this third hand or fifth hand? Second hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I'd just like to ask you a question because someone brought it to Obviously my not from the end of this weekend. <laughs> um, the fusion treatments, mm -hmm. are those, is there a guideline like Commissioner Carter's talking about? You know, is there a, a threshold you have to meet to, and I know this fusion treatment that I'm speaking about it occurs in Chapel Hill, UNC Hospital. Mm -hmm. I believe that Cone Health has an infusion treatment um, as well. Um, I do not know what the criteria is okay. for folks to qualify to get that. Um, I believe they're operating um, on the daily, but I don't have any details about that. I'm sorry. I can't get that information. That'd be great. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to for you to share the slides with us if you could too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this next slide um, is showing you that the red um, bars, that is the Delta variant, and so um, approximately 95% of the cases that we're experiencing now are the Delta variant. Um, this slide here, um, in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, it shows July's age data for cases, and then in the bottom right corner, this is August's um, age data. The um, majority of cases are still in the 50 and younger category. Um, the 0 to 17 age group is going up um, in the 65 and plus category. Um, it was 6% during the month of July and 9% um, now in August. So um, just keeping an eye on that. We have a breakdown by the uh, ages and deaths. I'm sure we have that, um, but I don't have it with me. We can get that for you. Okay. And rest homes, do we have any kind of breakage, breakouts in rest homes like we did last time? That was the one that clobbered us the most. So that is um, here. We have, um, this is as of August 31st, 
five uh, nursing homes and residential um, group homes had, had outbreaks, and then one correctional fil facility with an outbreak, and then also as of the 31st, no child cares or schools were reported to have clusters. Just making a note here. It's interesting schools. Well, ABSS posts theirs, and it's different. They do have a dashboard, so I think that it's based off of time. Okay. Yes. And then um, this slide here shows our uh, vaccine data. This is from the CDC county level data. Um, the data that we post on our website is what Alamance County Health Department has done. Um, this is Alamance County as a whole. Um, all of the vaccinators and so this is showing you that uh, 40 let's see 53.6 percent of our vaccine eligible population has been fully immunized or fully vaccinated 55.7 percent of our population that's 18 years and older has been fully vaccinated and 80.2 percent of our 65 and older population has been fully vaccinated and we're not doing the daily reports like we did before are we um, the sit rep from the emergency management, they're doing that on a weekly basis. Um, but the county's um, COVID dashboard, what, what we publish on the COVID dashboard, that's updated daily. Oh, what happened? What did I do? Did I do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to take a picture rather than try to type all of that. Okay. <laughs> okay. I thought there was one more slide. There no, must not be. The okay. Oh. All right. Well, uh, I guess he just wants me to talk about this <laughs> and not have a slide about it. So, um, our mission is shots in arms, um, safety, and efficiency. Um, we have started doing the third dose vaccine for folks who are moderately and severely immunocompromised. We started that about a week and a half ago. Um, we are continuing to do mobile outreach uh, to communities who have um, access to care issues. We're working with ABSS to um, hold some vaccination events for during school hours for school, the 12 and up um, age group. We're planning four events at different schools. Um, our National Guard has been helping us since uh, January, and they were extended until December, and so we're thankful to have them helping us. Um, we have begun planning for the um, booster shots uh, that would um, be associated with the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, um, so we're planning for that, um, should that be approved through um, CDC and ACIP. And then we are still offering appointments um, Monday through Friday between 8 and 5 at the health department. Folks can schedule appointments um, by going to www.vaccinatealamance.com or they can call our um, COVID appointment line. That's 336-290-0650. And repeat and, that again, please. Okay. Um, the phone number is 336-290-0650. You'll talk to a real live human being to schedule an appointment. Or if you want to do it online, it's vaccinatealamance.com. And that is for scheduling first, second, or third doses. Um, when you leave us from your first dose, we will make you an appointment for a second dose. Um, but if you got your first dose somewhere else and are having a hard time getting that second dose, we will happily um, get that second dose for you. And then folks who meet the criteria for third doses, we're scheduling those as well. And we do accept walk-ins Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 as well. And the location of that walk in is? It's 1913 McKinney Street in Burlington, right? At the, um, if you're familiar when it was the old hospital, it's the same day surgery area. Question uh, 12 and up has to have parental consent, correct? Written parental consent for 12 to 15. Since the Pfizer vaccine was authorized um, for 16 and older, written parental consent is no longer required for 16 and older because it is an authorized vaccine and then now are you guys doing the shots on site or is this being put on the school nurses 
No, we are doing okay. when we go to schools. Right. Is that so? We're going to work um, in partnership with the school nurses, but we're going to have our team out there and hoping that it's a partnership effort. Okay, because I've heard several that the school nurses are really overwhelmed. Sure. And I'm sure they are because they got all kind of numbers at their schools with testing and culture, all that stuff. So just big teamwork available. So. Do people get to choose which vaccine they're going to get, or yes. is it based on availability? It's, um, we have all three. Right now, we have, we've been able to offer all three vaccines. Um, but if you get a first dose of one thing, then you continue that track. Right. Um, but right now, people could walk in today and ask for Moderna, Pfizer, or Janssen. Right. So 12 to 15 has to have parental consent. Written parental consent. Okay. 16 and up, parents, be sure you know this your kids can get the shot on their own because I mean 16 and up you can consent to sex so you might as well consent to a shot and I'm not saying that lightly that's just the law so parents be nosy and talk to your kids know what they're doing our nurses do a very good job of um, screening um, my everyone but minors particularly to make sure that there's a um, a conversation being had at home good. or with guardians that's important home. Yeah. Any other questions, Mr. Turner? Quick question. What did you say was the percentage of children 12 to 17 who are vaccinated in the county? Let's see if I can read this. this 12 to 17 fully vaccinated. You got it? Thank you. 53.6% uh, which is our pop our uh, vaccine eligible age, 53.6% are fully vaccinated. That's 12 That's, and up, right? 12 and up. Were you asking 18 and up? I'm just asking specifically uh, school-age kids, essentially what I'm looking for the breakdown. Oh, uh, just that population period. Um, we would have to do some digging to figure that out. I think previously it was around a third. Okay. It didn't have any so I'd be really interested in that number. And do we also know um, the update on when That's children under 12 may be able to obtain any vaccine? Um, we don't have any information about that um, coming down. The last thing, I know that they're working on that um, with Pfizer, with um, Moderna. It seems to have kind of paused. We have not heard anything about 12 and older for Moderna. Moderna is still... 18 and older, I think. Um, I'm sorry. And um, the uh, I know that they're meeting to dis they're reviewing data in regards to boosters for Pfizer and Moderna, and I think they're still um, in discussions. I believe it's been applied for, but I'm not 100% for the 12 uh, or younger than 12. Um, but we're updated on the weekly basis from the state or bi-weekly basis from the state and um, just kind of wait to hear from that. Okay, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Hager, are you or Mr. Johnson? Yeah, I'm sure Johnson's going to uh, speak to the uh, licensed clinical social worker position, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Good morning, commissioners. I'm coming for you today to ask you to give me the ability to unfreeze the licensed clinical social, social worker position in the detention center. This particular individual uh, duties will include but not limited to conducting mental health screenings and assessments on detainees providing treatment as needed, coordinating pre and post release treatment and coordinated re entry discharge planning for detainees and working on a broad range of social work functions as needed within the detention center. Work may be uh, done jointly, uh, planned with other members from multidisciplinary teams such as medical staff in the facility, community profession, judges, attorneys, uh, behavioral health staff, and other partners. And right now we have 52 uh, vacancies in the Alamance County Sheriff's Office. I'm asking that we be able to hire the licensed clinical social worker because it would be advantageous to us in our detention center at this time. 
So commissioners, uh, county staff have reviewed the job description of the licensed clinical social worker for the detention, determined that based on the interim guidance that we've received from ARP, this position could be funded using ARP funds. We've talked with the sheriff about the possibility of using lap salary, but we feel like it's a little early in the fiscal year for me to be able to guarantee you that lap salary will cover this position. I think it's possible the sheriff's department will uh, be able to cover it with lap salary, but we do feel like it's eligible for ARP spending to pay for this salary. So the commissioners could, uh, at this point, approve using ARP funds to fund the remaining uh, uh, from September 1st till June 30th for this position. That is in a dollar amount of 56000 $255 that is salary and benefit costs for the social worker position for the rest of the fiscal year. And then if, uh, if lap salary exists in the uh, detention department later in the year, we could come back to commissioners. If you wanted to use it uh, later, lap salary to cover and revert our ARP funds back into the ARP pot, pot we could do that. But uh, at this point, I feel like it's uh, reasonable to recommend to the commissioners to consider ARP funding to allow the sheriff to hire this position immediately. We'll track his lap salary and come back to you later if it looks like uh, it's a better use of funding to use laps instead of ARP. And that's your recommendation? Yes, sir. I believe uh, the sheriff uh, has indicated they feel strongly this position is important uh, to enhance the mental health services that are provided at the detention center. This was one of the 14 positions that we froze uh, to start the fiscal year. Um, so there are this position and 13 other detention officer positions that have been frozen. Um, so the sheriff's request is to unfreeze this one, use ARP money, uh, and as I say, if later on in the fiscal year it looks like lap salaries will do it, we will come back to the commissioners and cover it with laps and take the ARP money back into the ARP pot. And, uh, and I would also indicate that uh, you know, we're working on the detention center. We, we've had meetings monthly for the last several uh, months. Uh, just had a meeting last week in the sheriff's office with uh, all the players as to that detention center. And that will be parallel to this issue uh, in helping uh, particularly right. those that uh, inmates or not that have uh, issues. Again, motion to approve. I have, I have a few questions. Yes, sir. All right, I'll second the motion. Okay, Sheriff Johnson. Yes, sir. Have you hired any new employees since July 1st? We've hired, uh, uh, we've lost, we've hired and we've lost. Yeah, that's what I was, what, what's, your, yeah. what's your name? Well, we, we have hired new employees and we've got some uh, on the burner at this time, but we're completing all the investigation. We have new on these individuals. So you're net negative? Yes, sir. Um, I guess my only comment is uh, I would be, I would feel more comfortable if this position was taken out of your lap salary uh, because uh, if it doesn't, you just increased your budget over last year. Uh, so, you know, if I could use some of that lap salary money, then we could hold on to the ARP. I'm just trying to be uh, more focused on the accounting part of, of, of your budget because this last budget that we uh, passed, you know, we certainly should stick to what our budget is. And, and I do believe that, the, I do believe the money's there. And like I've told you before, if you get on the hiring spree and you need some more folks, we will get the money for you. But initially, it would make me feel more comfortable to take that money out of the budget and then come back to it maybe at a later time and grant the ARP funds if that's the case. But that's just my personal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and commissioners, that could be done if the board feels more comfortable using lap salary. What I, I can't tell you right now that based on our analysis of the detention salary and the sheriff's office salary that he has a lap salary right now. I think it's very likely he will by the end of the year. You could take this in another direction if the commissioners feel more comfortable with it by allowing the sheriff to unfreeze the position fund it with salary that exists in the detention office budget now. If the sheriff's office runs short, if they run, if they start overspending their salary at the end of the year, we can supplement that with ARP because this position in particular is eligible for ARP funding. So that's, a, that's another way to do it. Uh, from my perspective, I'm not seeing enough lap salary to feel comfortable to guarantee you right now, but we're only two months into the fiscal yeah, year. So uh, if, if, 
if the commissioners want to do that, the key to the sheriff, I think, is to be able to unfreeze the position. Right. That that does take board action. Mm -hmm. um, and if you if you'd rather do it that way, allow them to hire from the existing funds uh, of the detention budget. That's acceptable too. We'll be watching his budget, and if he's running over because of this, we could put ARC dollars in later in the fiscal year uh, to supplement his budget. We could put ARC dollars in if we put take this if we fund this out of lap salaries. We can come back and replace it with ARC dollars. If if he starts overspending, so let's say uh, you know because this is a position that existed right. before this fiscal year, but it was empty at the beginning of the fiscal year. So this was why this position was frozen along with the the thirteen other detention officer positions. So the hope would be next year the sheriff's office is hired up. Right, all these positions are full, and we're having the budget for detention to include these 13 because there's bodies in there, and they're back to full shifts. So this is a position we hope does get filled at some point, either this fiscal year or next year. I guess what I'm saying is, we're early in the fiscal year. Uh, he has vacancies in both sheriff's office and detention. My perception of this is either let him, let the sheriffs fill the position and fund it with the money that's already in salaries for detention that sticks with the current budget. You don't use any ARP at this time. You would be voting to unfreeze the position. Sheriff would go in higher and we would watch the budget uh, for the sheriff's office salary. Later in the fiscal year, if we see the sheriff's office is overspending and putting ARP dollars toward this salary would help, the position's eligible to use ARP uh, money for that would be done to keep him from blowing his budget. So uh, if, you're, if you're more inclined to use the existing budget, which I certainly understand, then the consideration would be to vote to allow him to unfreeze and go ahead and hire. Right. I'll, I'll amend my motion to, to use lap salary money for this purpose then. And I modify my second. Mr. Mann, a couple questions. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, Mr. Hagan, you said that um, you think based on looking at the numbers that there was sufficient lap salary at the end of the year. Did you mean the end of the calendar year? The end of the fiscal year? Uh, come okay. June 30th of uh, 22, that, that'll be the end of our fiscal year. So ordinarily the Sheriff's Department does have lap salary left in detention. This is a little different. We we didn't fund 14 positions, right? So uh, there... Let me interrupt you real quick. So I thought you said that... that you could that there could be lap salary now, but you couldn't you didn't know for sure. Is there a time in the calendar when you will know, based on current spin rates, that there will be lap salary to cover this position in this fiscal year? Uh, maybe by the end of the calendar year, perhaps. I think right now the sheriff's office and the detention center are coming close to washing each other out with laps and, and spending. So, it, you know, as uh, Commissioner Lashley said, we're about two and a half months into the fiscal year, so it's a little early for me to be able to tell you that I can guarantee there'll be laps, but uh, I feel certain there will be. The Sheriff's Office usually does, uh, excuse me, detention usually has lap salary because of their vacancy rate, even beyond the frozen positions. Sure. how long will it take you to fill the position, you think? I hope soon, but, you know, we, we have to advertise it. We have to unfreeze the get Missouri's done frozen. We have to advertise it and uh, do background investigation. You're probably looking at a month. Yes. Most of the time, folks are having to give notice because you know you hope you're you're able to attract someone that's employed somewhere now as a in a similar position. So you're probably looking at 30 days uh, to be able to get someone in and working uh, for the sheriff. What is the no notification period? Uh, we usually post the position, I think, for at least two weeks. And uh, so we'll, we'll post it, take applications closed, and the sheriff's office will conduct interview. Well, they'll, they'll vet, vet the applications, select the group to bring in to interview. Uh, and then depending on where the person works, they may, you know, they may feel required to give anywhere from two weeks to 30 days notice, depending on their, their current employment. So it could be a month. A month is probably a safe bet to say it would be at least a month, maybe, maybe six weeks. Well, I, I do share Mr. Lassie's concern, Mr. Lassie concerned that we stay within budget. And I, I have a, a concern as well that we're beginning to, to plug holes that come up with ARPA funding. That's sort of our our knee-jerk reaction. Well, let's just go to ARPA. Uh, we, I think we, we don't have a strategic plan for that money, which I think maybe we'll talk about in the next agenda item. And so that, that's a concern there. But I certainly want to get the sheriff, uh, if he's got extra money in his budget, want to make that happen. I wonder if we might 
authorize it to be unfrozen as of November 1st. It takes 30 days to fill it, you think. By that time, based on what you're seeing, by the end of the calendar year, you think there might be sufficient lot sun, lot salary to cover. Uh, that's that's possible. I think uh, if the sheriff's office posts now and goes through all the the motions of hiring, it would be middle of October, uh, I would think, before they would be actually ready to hire an individual. So if the commissioners were to say the person could start, they would unfreeze the position effective November 1. I would suggest the sheriff could go ahead, post, go through all the hiring motions with the plan to be to bring the employee on board as a paid full-time employee at detention November 1. And then, again, as, as we say, we'll be watching the sheriff's uh, salary budgets for both detention and sheriff's office in the meantime. And again, the, the chances are, based on trend data from how the detention officer's salary budget usually performs. There, there will be lap salary. It's just at this time, I'm not seeing it enough to feel totally comfortable recommending it to you. But we do know ARP is there. In the event there isn't lap salary and the board wants to use ARP to keep the sheriff from blowing his detention budget because of the nature of the position, it could be done. But I'm concerned about putting a specific date on there, Mr. Turner. I'm, uh, I, would, I would just like to go ahead and vote today that we unfreeze this position um, out of necessity, just a time frame, it's going to be November 1 likely anyway, but I would uh, hesitate to put a firm date on it. And the dates, commissioners, were simply for the ARP budget figure in here, so when we were thinking how much ARP money might it take if, if the commissioners wanted to use ARP, we looked from September 1 to June 30th. So if you're, if you're, allow, if you're unfreezing it and the sheriff's going to pay from his existing budget, the, the dates may not be as important. Uh, yeah. And we're not going to pay any salary until the position is filled. Yes. Um, I just want us to all remember how hard it is for DSS to hire folks like this. And this person isn't somewhere hid just waiting for this position to fit them perfectly and then come from who knows where. Um, when I was on the Board of Education, I used to say that the school system was becoming DSS with a chalkboard because of everything they're doing. I mean, everything they're doing. And I'm a firm believer when you are doing everything, the thing that you are created to do kind of gets pulled away from. I feel like, and I mean, I'm over, I was over there yesterday for two hours with someone who has really serious issues. That's why they're there. Um, and I don't want your jail to become the new hospital because it. because it's looking like every time this isn't you but every time we turn around we are constantly catering to that population and there's victims because of that population and when and you know there's agencies that have to serve that victim too but I mean I was at a site the other week where someone got arrested. I was supporting somebody, and that person was taken, and they didn't even touch the jail floor. And they were right back around because of this bail reform and this, like, rotating door. It just really ticks me off. And, um, and I, just, I just feel like we just keep finding one more person to help the very people who are hurting the very people. And I mean, I am, I'm a Christian and I want you to be well, I want you to have a good life, but a lot of that has to do with your choices, you know? And there are consequences to your choices. Um, we're looking at an, another position, and, and Sheriff, I'm your biggest cheerleader, you know how much I love law enforcement. But at the same time, we couldn't give Parks and Rec another position that's nothing but positive in the county. There's such a need for everything that matters. Everything that matters because of all the agencies in this county make up this county. Just like the five of us come from different angles when it comes to discussing things like this. And, um, you know, it just, it just seems like it's just weighted all the time. And, um, and I mean, I, I, I just, you know, I'm over certain areas of town that we know what's going on in these places and lives are being destroyed in these places. And there are victims of crime. And I think, well, what are we doing for them? You know, because they never get over that crime. And um, I just, um, I, I just don't want you to have to do everything. 
because you don't that is not ARMC that is a jail for people who have broken the law that are going to have to be accountable and have consequences for their cotton picking behavior and when you're already short and I'm gonna say this when I was over there yesterday and I left you know getting someone living free there wasn't hardly any park any parkers you know in the parking lot I go down just a little bit and it's bloated just loaded where the detention officers work. It's Labor Day, everybody's off cooking out, but the detention officers are in there dealing with people that are already ticked, but be ticked off really when you're there on a holiday, which you invited yourself to go there. But I'm thinking they're always there. When I walk in, they're professional, they're as nice as they can be, and they do their job as though they're making a million dollars a year, and they're not. And we need, you know, I'm always for the little guy, little girl. And I just, I just don't, we just, sometimes we just have to watch our priorities because it becomes fashionable, just like stepping up. How many years have we been looking? We're finally gonna meet with Vaya on the 15th to get this program in action instead of meeting and talk about it. Sometimes counties can be like Baptist, I'm one, let's meet to schedule a meeting, to schedule another meeting. You just keep doing not what you're supposed to be doing. I know I'm on broom, I'm sorry. But um, I just feel like every time I turn around, Sheriff, you're in another position to take on one more job you're that you didn't run for. Run. for. <laughs> and um, I mean, I, it's just very frustrating to one more person to take care of. Oh, you need to be in my shoes. I don't want to wear them. <laughs> I don't want to wear shoes, but I couldn't ever feel them. But um, I'm just saying, it's an ARP is, is nice, but it's going to be leaving. And it's not going to fly across the sky anymore. So we cannot use it as our safety net in everything we're doing because we could have something really big that blows the lid off Alamance County that we need that for. So I know I'm just running my mouth like I always do. And I, but I just, you know, I, it just really frustrates me that we just seem to be catering to a population that is taking advantage of everybody else. So I'm done. Okay, we have a motion on the floor and a second. I have Any one last second? question for Mr. Haygood, okay. and it uh, just wanted to um, I will ask this question. Is there any way that you can look in his budget? Do you have an itemized a line item for lap salary that's currently sit sitting there? Uh, we have lines for salary and then the different benefits uh, costs that have individual lines but I think in the sheriff's budget it's uh, all in one code all the salaries are in one numbered line is that correct so what we do oftentimes is run an analysis of based on the current employment levels that he has how will that carry through for the rest right. of the year uh, I think that that is what we have done prior to coming in here and felt like between sheriff's office spending and detention spending it was a little early for me to say I could guarantee it, but uh, we do that quite often uh, with the sheriff's office in particular because they usually do have a lot of live salary left. So I was just curious. Um, I keep a spreadsheet, mm -hmm. and but mine's not all updated. I was just making some notes to uh, talk to your clients. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we don't have a home. we don't have a separate line specifically for lapse salary, but we usually we can give a pretty good estimate of what they might leave. That's what I have. I have a general estimate that yes. I. That I think that's probably I'm looking at his 13 employees that he's got, and I just have a general idea. But I was just you know really curious if we could get some uh, you know an idea. And he says he's net negative as far as employees are concerned. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we can you know sheriff. I wish I had problem have to come to Mr. Uh, Haygood ask for more money to get you these folks that you need. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to be able to do that. I, I, I think that it certainly would. <laughs> yes. I think the, the goal is for the sheriff to be fully staffed. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's the goal. Everybody on shift and, uh, you know, folks folks working on a full shift. That's what everybody wants. So are we looking at this position, but not with ARP funds unless it absolutely has to be ARP funds? That's my okay. understanding as amended. The okay. motion was amended and the second was amended. Okay. All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. Okay, 4 1. Mr. Turner being the no. <coughs> thank you. Thank, thank all of y'all. Uh, you know, I wish I hadn't been, wouldn't have to appear before you on a situation such as this. 
We're doing the best we can, and we're going to continue to do that regardless. Thank you, Sheriff. We appreciate that. Thank you. Ms. Rollins. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. So our plan is to give a brief update on ARP every month until status stops changing. Um, so our last update was August 2nd. We did a big presentation that day. This one is a short one. Um, but on August 2nd, uh, we gave you some information. If there are any activities uh, that have resulted from that, I need to report that today. Any updates from the U.S. Treasury, we would report today. Any actions for you to consider and uh, any questions that we might need to follow up on. We want to do that uh, at least once a month until, uh, like I said, until this ARP has uh, settled down and we, we understand how to handle it. But on August 2nd, um, what we talked about there was the big picture of what the rules were. We have interim guidance at this point. We still don't have a final final <laughs> guidance from the U.S. Treasury, but we hope to see that by the end of this month. Uh, they've been saying September, and September is now here. So hopefully when we come back at the beginning of October, we'll have some more information for you there. Um, there was board action on August 2nd where we requested a budget amendment to budget $1,024,764 for a handful of activities that we felt confident were very likely ARP eligible. And the update on that, were, um, that, that was to provide some funding for family abuse services and crossroads sexual assault response. There were three county positions and then there was some ARP eligible software and equipment that we were planning to purchase. And all of that is in progress. So when we uh, contract with uh, our outside agencies, Family Abuse and Crossroads, we need an actual document. So we have a template that was prepared. It's under review. And um, the services that they will provide will be part of that contract. So that's in progress right now and should be completed before we come back to report next month. The um, positions have, were all posted and are in various state of um, being hired. Uh, one position was a uh, after hour social worker that has been filled internally. Uh, one position was a communicable disease nurse that's in progress, so they're, they're interviewing and uh, trying to hire there. And then the grant administrator position was uh, advertised and will be starting interviewing uh, in September, so this week. And uh, we're also considering maybe getting a contract worker. While we're trying to find the right person for grant administration, uh, we still have to evaluate these uh, grant opportunities out there. If we find a contract worker that might work for us, uh, we'd look into doing that while we're trying to hire and fill the position. I don't understand. So, uh, I, I'm please. sorry, and let me jump in and just say that there, there are a lot of folks looking for grant administrators right now, I think because of ARP and all these federal dollars. So. Uh, we don't want to miss any opportunities to apply for any funding that we might be eligible for or some of our community partners might be eligible for. If we find something that we think we should go after uh, before we're able to hire because we're, uh, you know, so many folks are trying to hire a grant person, we would find someone to contract with, to write the grant, provide all the documentation that whatever funding source needs and to see it through until we get somebody hired. Um, our concern is if it takes us three months to hire someone, to be our grant administrator, we just don't want to miss any opportunities to, to go after grants that we find because we don't have a full-time employee on staff. The hope is to hire, I'm sure we will, but uh, it just it seems like lots of folks are looking for grant people right now. You know? So if you contract someone, is that like a so much per grant, you know what I'm saying? And or is that an hourly hour? temporary wage or what? It would probably be some hourly rate. Uh, we've not done that before for grants that I can remember. So it, uh, it would probably be, I would think, an hourly rate or something per grant. Would that be more economical to have a contract person instead of hire a full-time person? Because sooner or later, grants aren't going to be the popular thing, too, because things do stop. Sure. Well, I think our, our goal was to hire someone, and then their goal would be to bring in more than it's costing us to have them on staff, right? So the, the goal for the grant administrator would be if the, you know bring in more in your salary or benefits uh, in grant dollars. But I think uh, it may prove that contracting is more effective. But we're, we're on the hunt. We're trying to find the right one. That we can uh, 
tasked specifically with doing just our stuff. One of the things about contracting is, you know, if they find someone else to work for or uh, they have other folks that are contracting with them, we'll be competing with them for their time. So if we can find that full-time employee, we want a good one too. We want somebody good and qualified and motivated uh, to work for us. Have we been writing grants up until COVID? Uh, we've had, I think, several departments go after grants. I know uh, our emergency management department does grants. Parks and Recreation Department does grants. Uh, the library has gone after grants in the past. So, yes, and they've been successful doing that. So they didn't have a grant writer. They, they did their grants. Well, I think the Parks Department had a position. I don't know if Brian's still here. I don't know. I can't remember now. That person left, uh, so I don't remember. We have a position that does uh, basically half half their job is grants and the other half is our, our communications website for the department. Well, as good as you are getting free land, mm -hmm. maybe you need to apply for this job. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyer. We're good at that because I have a grant for there. But you're not going to let anybody know who it is, right? If I'm doing uh -huh. the paperwork, we're in Okay. <laughs> Mr. Hagen, I've asked, I, I think I've asked you this before. Could we access the grant writers over ABSN? Y'all know I volunteered for last time. She won't answer my calls. I'm kidding. I know it's tough. I mean, I mean I they're know, all Angela Boss is amazing. They know how. They know where all the bells are. They know where everything's going. I mean, they yes. do have a firm grasp on how this grant writing. Goes. Can we trade a roof for a grant writer? <laughs> I mean, there's got to be some dealing going on here somehow. No, I, I think that's a great idea, and you know, I I know. Um, uh, it's certainly valuable to reach out to them. I think we've brainstormed about some people in the community that uh, we could also reach out to as we look to hire. And if again, if it if it starts proving to be more effective uh, to contract, then we would certainly we want the success. Yeah. We want the grant dollars to be able to come in and help us with these projects that have, uh, have been identified. So I think ABSS has excellent grant writing folks, and we know that there are some in the nonprofit community that we thought about as we continue to look. Those are good, good outlets for us to approach and try to stay, stay on top of these uh, funding sources. Yes. Have we checked with the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners or with the National Association? Or so we are open to all of those options. Absolutely. Yeah. At this point, we're looking for if we can get the right person hired, we'll do that immediately. If we don't get the right person actually applying for the position, we're gonna um, we are looking at all of those options, whether it's a uh, individual in our community, whether they're uh, referred through an agency, even um, uh, there are agencies out there that do this um, as part of their uh, other services. Right. So we're just, we're letting you know that uh, we're open to that, hoping to get the right fit as quickly as possible. Let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Haygood and I are contacting Elon uh, University regarding internships and things of that sort. Uh, Ms. Haygood, have we contacted Elon or other universities concerning grant writers? I think that all of these things would be on the table for us to do as we as we go through the hiring process. And again, you know, our concern is we want to, if we hire, we want to find the right person, the motivated person, hopefully that has experience in these uh, federal grants. Most of what we have seen so far is federal. I will just say that I think there's a there's a lot of need for that right now because there's so much of this art money and so many other local governments are doing the same thing. They're saying we gotta we gotta try to get somebody on board to do this. So I think the school system, Elon University, our nonprofit world out there, we're gonna continue to try to find that right fit until then. I think all these are excellent uh, uh, outlets for us to contact. So, and hey, Mr. Uh, Maker, Elon University internships. Yes, we have one coming soon. I think we have a few lined up. So we do a pretty good business with those guys. Excellent. So there was some uh, equipment and um, the UV equipment is being priced and we do have purchasing guidelines that we have to follow that take a little bit of time. So the uh, detention center is also working on uh, hiring, uh, uh, sorry, purchasing uh, some healthcare software. So of what was budgeted in August, we're still in progress, hope to complete very shortly. Um, we also discussed at that time that we thought that approximately $3.2 million of our spending for March through June of last fiscal year might be ARP eligible. And um, so with, uh, with your blessing, we went and looked to see 
exactly what were those costs and what was the exact amount. And we're reporting today that over 3.8 million of those costs uh, seem to be are eligible. So we have $3,842,981 that we've identified in staffing costs, PPE purchases, and other uh, pandemic response purchases that we believe happened during March through June that we believe would be ARP eligible. What we did um, was, uh, after coming up with that list, uh, we had a, a filing deadline. The U.S. Treasury re required us to submit a preliminary report on August 31st. So we submitted those costs to the U.S. Treasury as possible ARP reimbursable costs. And uh, to do once we've done that, um, the local, the small municipalities that were less than 50,000 did not have a filing deadline, but the counties and the big um, metropolitan areas had that early deadline. What we've done is we've submitted that information, hoping that the U.S. Treasury will use it to give better guidance, and it also um, would be a uh, a way for us to save some of our own general funds from last fiscal year to use in future in different ways. So it's saved our fund balance in the general fund. So um, that information uh, was provided to the U.S. Treasury. We have no idea if they're going to respond, uh, but we did meet their deadline and it is amendable. So if that was something that uh, later on we found out that the guidance changed or uh, the board's direction based on strategic initiatives and strategic planning, if that changes, uh, we could change this report as well. It's, it's not irrevocable. So once again, we're waiting on that final guidance and everything that we do now is in preparation for making decisions. Uh, we receive regular requests or information about things that people think, uh, projects or programs that people think that might be ARP eligible that would be helpful to our community. We're maintaining that list. We have what we call our master list. It's a list of all of these projects, programs, any uh, capital things that um, uh, might be ARP eligible in the future. We're waiting for the final guidance in order to determine eligibility. We also look at the list to determine if there's another funding source, a better funding source, in order to uh, share that with folks who might be ready to move forward faster than, uh, than the U.S. Treasury. Um, <laughs> So uh, we're ready with that information um, and, and continue to add to it every week uh, in, uh, for, for consideration at some point. But until we get the final guidance, it's still preliminary information at this point. So what we have to do, commissioners, is once we get that final guidance, we will take all the suggestions of possible ways to spend ARP money that we have been cataloging ever since uh, ARP was first talked about and come before you with that, with that master list with these potential things categorized into these are acceptable via the ARP final guidance. These are not, but appear to be COVID related. Uh, if the board uh, uh, goes through with this action today to designate these funds that we're recommending uh, you spend in ARP into our pandemic response fund, it's possible you could use those funds to do things that maybe ARP final guidance says you cannot do, but you want to do as a board of commissioners. Uh, so I, I imagine, but the hope would be uh, in October, if we get final guidance between now and the end of this month, we're coming to the commissioners in the month of October with that master list categorized by uh, who's asking for it, what what does it attempt to accomplish, and is it ARP eligible or not? So you actually need two motions, is that correct? You need one motion for the uh, $3,842,981 for the funding uh, that are eligible you need a second motion and vote on the uh, general fund balance in the same amount for future pandemic responses. Is that correct? That's correct. Do we have such a motion? I have one, I have one question. Yes, sir. Um, just want to clarify. <clears throat> the uh, 3842000 number that is eligible for the 2021 expenditures, is this going into our general fund to be used at a later time, or is it being designated strictly for pandemic? So without board action, using ARP funds for that $3.8 will effectively free up general fund 
and the general fund, what will be added to our unassigned fund balance would be larger by that amount. Right, and I was going to ask, does this, is this $3.8 million, is it in addition to yeah. what we did the previous time uh, with the, um, I'm just looking at your, your, your um, paragraph here, $1.025 million AOP funding that we did for, and then we estimate we had about $3 million, right at $3 million, that went into our general fund to be used at a later time? So instead of the $3 million, it's actually 3.8. Okay. We'll just refine the number for you. All right, but that money will be in the general, in our general fund to be used at a later time. So the, the, the one million twenty five thousand that that money's just spent right. on these items. So it won't go general fund des or designated fund. The last meeting, we estimated the, the amount of eligible spending between March and June to be about $3.2 mm -hmm. It's really this $3.8 million. So the $3.2 million figure is not applicable anymore gotcha. upon review, this three point eight. million. And the commissioners, if you choose to spend ARC funds to the tune of the $3,842,981, if you choose to do so on these eligible costs, you can either designate them. We, we will put them in our pandemic response fund that we currently have, which was leftover monies from coronavirus uh, <coughs> funding from last fiscal year, that you can either spend or not, right? Or you can let it go into the fund balance. Uh, the, the difference would be if you want to use it for anything, you're going to be taking it from, um, I guess, unassigned fund balance to be spent on um, uh, whatever you want to spend it on. If you put it in pandemic, We've been spending pandemic response funds on pandemic related activities, right? So court screeners, jail cleanup, all, all those kind of things. We are fully allocated at this point. There is no more pandemic response funds available to allocate out. Everything's been allocated for some use. So we're capped out. If you put this money in, it can either be used for if we continue to have COVID related expenses, or uh, if you see these art projects that you want to consider and you wanted to use some of this 3.8 million for that, you could do that too without the ARP uh, restrictions. restrictions. And what is this 3.8? What is that? Like, is that a position? Is that a. a I think the majority of it, if I'm not mistaken, mass? is I mean, salaries, is the salaries of uh, county employees and the time they spent working pandemic response, COVID response between March and June. And that's uh, lots of people in uh, EMS. Uh, I can't remember. Health other. Department and EMS were focused on pandemic response, so we applied um, their salaries for that time period. So they weren't paid for that? They were paid, but what you're able to do is pay that cost with ARC funds, which would free up $3.8 million of county dollars that you can then designate into pandemic response if you want to, to use for ARC projects or or you, you'll see some art projects on that master list that don't meet art guidance, but you may want to do them anyway, right? The, if you designate these funds, they would be there for you to use. You could let it go into unassigned fund balance. It's a little easier, I think, to track if you designate it, if you want to use it for uh, COVID-related response that art won't let you do, but you still want to do it. We're, this does allow the board a little more flexibility once you start reviewing projects. You don't have to spend it at all. You could. Uh, this money won't go away in three years. Once it's designated, it's yours. And if you say, we don't want to spend it on anything, we want to revert it back to fund balance, you can do that. If you designate it now, we track it in such a way that it's really for these ARC related projects, but it doesn't mean you have to spend it. You may choose not to. Okay, one question before, just, one, before I forget, you know how that works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just saying, these extra monies that was went to first responders, did that original money come out of our basic money or the COVID CARES money, whatever they wanted to call it before? It was county county general fund budget. It was dollars so budget for the- special money, it was our money. No, that, that's correct. It, so uh, this is paying us back right. with ARC funds for ARC related stuff for our money. That's correct. Right. Okay, I'm good. And, you're, and you don't have to designate it. I would suggest you consider it. So when you see the big list of things you may want to do, this may let you do some things on the list that ARP won't let you do. I guess I'm trying to. So. Or we could not spend it. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that's hey. Kind of where I was getting ready to go. This is about, about two pennies on the tax rate. Um, yes. So. Now this will not be recurring. Do remember right. this is this is right. a one time one time uh, expense. Just so. to clarify, if something, if we, something happens and we need to go for it, I mean to use this money, it's possible. But we don't have to. 
That's correct. Okay. Just making sure. Once, just, if you, just if you vote to okay. designate it, we will track it in the pandemic response fund. So we'll be able to always report to you how much is there and you can choose to spend it or not. But it won't go away in three years when ARC goes. If it sits in this designated fund for the next three years, this 3.8 million, ARC funds go away if we don't spend it, right? So there's no way you could do this with the 30 some million? I think it's possible to do it with more of the 30 some million because uh, one of the things I've asked Andrea and, and her staff to do is now start looking at the spending we are currently doing, right, right going forward. What might be eligible in our 21-22 uh, budget uh, that we could revert if you choose. You could use ARP spending to cover things that are currently budgeted, put the current county dollars into the same designated fund, sit tight, watch what comes in on the ARP proposals. If you want to spend it, wonderful. If you do not, you can leave it in the designated fund uh, for three years or however long you want to leave it there, but it will not go back to the to the feds if you don't spend it. So, so that would be like in your checkbook. It would be, it would be, you know, uh, the county checkbook. Yes. Yeah. Uh, be clear on that. Our, our staff reviewed all those expenditures uh, for that period of time. And what we're, what we're gearing up to do now is watch our expenditures as we go forward and say, okay, what of county dollars could we do this again? If the commissioners want to do that, the, the benefit to me would be it puts these, it takes the county dollars puts the ARP money in place to pay ARP eligible expenditures. You can then take the county dollars and put it in this designated fund and fund other projects. I would just say one time projects are probably best, yeah. right? Because these only, they're only gonna be there till they're spent, right? Uh, but then again, at the end of the day, if you do not spend it or you choose not to spend they it. They can't take it. No, and the only thing that might happen is if at some point during our audits over the next three years, the treasury says that expenditure was not uh, eligible. We will then argue with them as we do with FEMA and other groups. We'll go back and forth for a while. At some point, if they ever said that particular expenditure is not, uh, then it might be that we would have to go back into the designated fund. We would come back to the commissioners and say that piece of equipment that we bought, the, the feds have said we could not use ARC. We request to use some of our designated funds to, to put that money back. So I think, and I think Andrew would probably agree, for the next probably year and a half, to two years as we get into spending these money, be uh, audited and work with Treasury, that could happen. But I think putting the funding in designated funds allows you a lot of flexibility, even to the point of not spending it at all. Right. So, well, and we could take it back out of that at some future date if we wanted to and spend it for something totally unrelated. Yes, yes. It, it, just because it goes into the designated fund for pandemic response does not mean that you couldn't pull it out of that with board action to use for some other project that you wanted to use. It may not have anything to do with pandemic. Um, putting it in pandemic right now just allows it to continue to be part of the art project discussion. And frankly, you know, we really thought we had, we had seen the tailing off of COVID. And now we've got this uptick with this new variant. We're, we're at the end of our original CRF monies. We, we, we haven't spent them all, but we've allocated them, right? So, Having some in designated fund is helpful in the event this we have another variant or a more significant outbreak, rather than we're having to tap unassigned fund balance. If we have these, we would break in on the art process. If we were to see that, you know, the pandemic stepped up significantly and we really started incurring costs, God forbid, we would come in to the art process as staff and say, we're, we're seeing real problems you need to put a take a time out on the art project spending and make sure we can cover health, EMS, CECOM, detention, whatever's going bad. So that's a priority. Yes, I think the COVID response yeah. is absolutely a priority. Okay. And, and I think we're hearing that it's possible the final guidance is going to be a little less restrictive, but we don't know that for a fact, but you know, word on the street is it may be less restrictive than the interim guidance. So you may have more uh, ability to choose other projects. Right, yeah. Well, what do you want? What do you want to do? I got a yay. <laughs> okay, we had two separate motions. Um, first motion is to affirm the use of the three million eight hundred forty-two thousand nine hundred eighty-one dollars of art funding for eligible twenty twenty-one expenditures. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Go ahead, Steve. That's fine. You got it. Right? Have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? There being none. 
Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, it's unanimous. Thank you. The second motion is to designate for the 2021 general fund balance the $3,842,981,000 for future pandemic relief or responses. I'll make that motion. Okay. okay. okay you got it, Pam. Give it to Craig because he's out of town. <laughs> <laughs> you had him seconded one today, yet, Craig, right? <laughs> okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Turner, what was your vote? My vote, aye. Thank you. Is you now. Mr. Chairman, if, if I might, uh, I have another uh, uh, issue that is on topic. If I might uh, have a few minutes here. Please. Um, we've, I have somewhat of a concern, and I mentioned it during the, the Sheriff's presentation, that, that we lack strategic vision for how we're going to handle this ARPA money. And I know that, um, that we're waiting for final guidance. Expect that out hopefully within about a month, uh, which would give us some more parameters. Uh, but I still think we need to be thinking in advance of that uh, some type of process where, where we can begin to think strategically of how to spend this money, or else, whenever there's a hole, somebody's going to want to want to fill it with ARPA money, and it's just going to deplete and deplete. And so, 32 32 million dollars is no longer there. So, I, I think we need to put something in place where we. Uh, we really think about how to handle this. Uh, I had mentioned in the past um, a, a committee of citizens where the citizens can, can receive input from others in the community and then make recommendations uh, to the commission based on, on public meetings, information that they've heard from other sources. We've talked about we wanted to keep, if we have something like that, we want to keep it small. I, I'd like to propose a that we move forward with that. And I'd like to talk about how that might look and in the end present it in the form of a motion if, uh, if Mr. Chairman would allow that. I think we certainly can allow it. I would encourage us to do that on the um, the meeting on the 20th and give us time to do the planning and so forth. Uh, that will be our next meeting. And I would encourage us not to take up a new proposal today uh, but let's do some planning and, and allow staff to come to us with the proposal. And in the interim, we as board members should go to staff and talk to them about your ideas. That, that's, uh, that's fine. Thank you. Two weeks yesterday. Okay. Uh, Okay, good. I think uh, Ms. Elliott is next. Is that correct? Yes. Good morning again. So um, we received notification of funding from um, the Department of Public Health um, in regards to uh, for public health nurse school health liaison. This is allocating $115,000 to Alamance County um, to assist with the school system with uh, testing and um, contact tracing and case investigation work. There's no match to it. No match required, and it is uh, federal pass-through money that um, we will use to um, pay for contract staff to do that work. I'll make a motion we approve this. Second. Any further discussion? <laughs> All in favor, favor signify by saying aye. 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 Mr. Turner? Aye. Thank you. Is she unanimous? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? We do not. Mm -hmm. oh, All right. I'm in favor of that. <laughs> Are there any commissioner responses? You know, I wanted to make one simple statement. And I wanted to just take your attention back to our consent agenda with the uh, acceptance of the late property tax with the um, textile museum and the other uh, folks at the uh, Beyond Measure Ministries I just wanted to say that I just wanted everyone to hear me when I say this that we 
all, as people in this country and in this society, we all have deadlines that are firm. And I'm not very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not very sympathetic to folks who miss their deadlines and come in six months later. I would just like to tell the textile museum and the uh, ministry to let's make sure that we follow these guidelines. When we have a deadline, we meet that deadline. And if you miss that deadline, then you are the one that has to pay the price. I'm just saying that if you, I, everyone should follow the deadlines. If there's a deadline, it's there for a reason. And I think that we should make sure that people are held accountable for these deadlines. And they're asking for preferential treatment now that there's seven months delayed for their deadline. So I just wanted to let them know that um, we're looking and I truly want them as we go forward to be meeting and beating these deadlines going forward. That's my understanding. Thank you. Because they are every year. It, it, it's the same time every yeah. year. It's like April 4, April 15th is the same time every year. And you get lucky when you have COVID and you get two months delayed. Okay. <laughs> That's not seven. No. Just wanted to be more aware of the responsibilities. Okay, Mr. Haycat. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Only uh, two items I would bring to the commissioner's attention is uh, uh, the Association of County Commissioners and the National Association of Counties have provided us with a disposal box for United States flags, and uh, we're placing that disposal box at the Veteran Service Office located at 102 North Maple. I know that Tammy Crawford has indicated that she has had folks contact her in the past. They exist in other locations around the county. I I think uh, the chair had mentioned uh, that they do exist at the VFW post on Webb Avenue. This will be uh, located at the Veteran Service Office. We're very uh, glad to be able to provide that service for people to properly dispose of uh, U.S. flags. We'll work with uh, groups like Boy Scouts to properly dispose of them once they're received. So uh, I think Tammy's pleased to be able to offer that. And, and would you state the location of that for the public? Indeed. Uh, the Veteran Ser Alamance County Veteran Service Office is located at 102 North Maple Street in Graham, so folks can uh, Google that and find the street address and feel free to bring their flags. So. That's sort of in the back of the old Ag building, by the way. Uh, I assume that box will be placed out far enough that it won't be hard to locate. Yes, yes it will. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it has to be taken in and put out during the day, so it may, or I'm, I'm, I've talked with Tammy about if it'll be available on weekends, but it will be out. So. Uh, folks can call uh, the Veteran Service Office too, and I think they they have already had numerous calls before we learned we were able to get this box uh, about where to take flags. And I would really encourage everyone to use those uh, facilities. Yes. Um, your flag's getting old, whatever you do not throw it in the trash. No, no. Yeah. And the only other point I wanted to make is I believe I believe the commissioners have received a copy of their map book. Yes. So uh, every year, the Association of County Commissioners produces a, a county map book. There's a lot of good information in this book. Uh, a lot It gives the commissioners an idea of how Alamance County stock, uh, stacks up with our surrounding counties and counties across the state. So take a few moments to look at this. It is available online if any of your constituents are interested in it through the Association of County Commissioners website. But we wanted the board to have a hard copy. Uh, it's always good info in here. So take time to peruse it and as I say it's available through the Association of County Commissioners website if uh, you have uh, citizens that are interested in looking at it too and Mr. Chairman that is all that I have so thank you. One comment I might add to that too uh, Mr. Haygood the Knights of Columbus also do mm -hmm. have a program where they do retirement of American flags and so do the Boy Scouts. That's if right. Have a boy, if you have a child in the Boy Scouts most Boy Scout troops not the Cubs but most of uh, the way I understand it, most Boy Scout groups also do that as a part of their uh, program to teach respect for the flag. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It'd be good if they could go out through the entire country to respect our flag automatically because we are so blessed to live in the United could, States. Could America. we, you know, you're in the veterans. Could we go to the veterans and, and buy some flags? I've just been seeing some different things around town that's some flags that are like old and tattered. Mm -hmm. Could we, um, as county commissioners, could, I don't mind paying for myself, 
buy 10, 20 flags and donate them to like Crossroads. I'm thinking the Willows over on Tarpley. You know, that's a, it's a yes. uh, and I see their flag. I walk by there a lot. I see their flag needs to be more new. Can we do something like that? I'm, yes, sir. I'm sure we can. I think that's a good idea. Sometimes I think folks uh, either just don't pay attention to the flag or it's up and they're not noticing its condition and it is it is troubling if you go by and see an American flag. Yeah, well, knowing that you know, I could go down to the Veterans Center or something, and buy a new flag, and yes. hoist it up, and it's all brand new again. Yes, I think that's a very good idea. Well, there, are, there are protocol protocols mm -hmm. to display the flag, yes. which many times I see are being violated. But I have, on several occasions, pointed out to citizens in the community when I had an opportunity that there were flag, their flag needed to be replaced, and helped them make arrangements to do that. Um, sometimes I think uh, we, we've done that too and sometimes I think folks haven't paid attention to it in a while or noticed mm -hmm. that it's tattered and or faded or whatever but uh, I think that's a that's a good idea okay excellent anyway down to commissioners or uh, comments yeah, man, one quick man I just wanted to uh, say sorry I couldn't be there in person for the record, I've got a jury trial scheduled in Davidson County this afternoon, so I needed to reposition myself. <laughs> well, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, well, you definitely will not get home cooking in uh, Long County. So <laughs> okay. My uh, comment, 9-11 is Saturday. Uh, the city of Graham is... Uh, doing a large event and so forth, downtown Graham. Uh, we as a county are joining with them uh, and are taking part in that. So I'm encouraging all five of us, even if in uh, heading toward Davidson County today, <laughs> to be there and participate. I'll encourage all the citizens to be part of that. Absolutely. Any other comments? Okay. Um, we have need to go into a, a closed session, so I will therefore move that we now go into a closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11, Plan A, Plan 1, to prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential and to consult with the county attorney. Do I have a second? Second. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry to interject, but the law requires you to state, when you go into closed session uh, for that reason, to state the um, law that renders the information to be discussed privileged or confidential, to state the law. Mr. Albright, do we need to modify our motion? No, this involves a uh, HIPAA matter. No, okay, HIPAA. Yeah. Okay. That answers the question. We have a motion to second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. We're in closed session. We need a motion to close the closed session. I'll make that motion. Second. second. All right. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. We're out of closed session. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make motion a motion to adjourn. adjourn. Mr. Lashley's motion to adjourn. Mr. Turner, do you second? Second. Do we not have to make a statement pertaining to the decision? Coming yeah, out of a closed session. I mean, there's we, nobody here, we, but uh, received and approved the advice, gave instructions to the county attorney. Right. Okay. Right. So, yeah, would you state that again, please? Sir? We received advice and gave instruction to the county attorney. All right. With that, uh, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And note that it is not 12 o'clock. <laughs> 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 Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 7 p.m. 
Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.